Okay, good afternoon, good evening, welcome to those of you who are waiting for a later dinner, welcome, those of you who have already eaten, it's uh, amazing food on this ship. I want to talk a bit about politics, not always an easy subject, but for me, it's what I spent my career doing. And I have an opportunity here in Spain, France, and Italy to take a look at three countries in the northern Mediterranean that I think were greatly affected by what happened in the southern Mediterranean, which is where I spent most of my career. In September 2008, I was sitting in a cramped, smoke-filled office with the leadership of the Kirkuk Provincial Council in northern Iraq. Kirkuk was a major oil-producing center, a city in turmoil fought over by Arabs, Kurds, and Turkmen for decades. With me was an army colonel, the commander of the U.S. military unit stationed in Kirkuk, a brigade of the 10th Mountain Division. We were trying to persuade the Kirkuk Council chairman to cancel a proposed referendum on the future status of the city. The Kurds dominated the council after the overthrow of Saddam's regime in 2003, and any referendum would certainly be rigged in their favor, an outcome that would, that would set off violent protests and a likely Arab insurrection. It would mean more bloodshed and violence in a city that had endured too much already. After hours of haggling, the chairman, a tough, chain-smoking Peshmerga, that's Kurdish militia, uh, that means facing death. That's what Peshmerga means, facing death, without hesitation. The chairman finally agreed. There would be no referendum. He would postpone it. The colonel and I went back to his quarters on the base, exhausted and relieved, and I said, see, I, tol I told you, diplomacy works. It's hard, it takes time, but it works. The next morning, as we met to discuss the day's schedule, the colonel's aide rushed in. On the TV and radio, the Kurdish chairman was announcing the referendum dates and urging all Kirkuk citizens to get out and vote for a free Kirkuk. The colonel clenched his teeth, opened his desk drawer, and took out his service revolver, a nasty-looking 45 caliber pistol. I'm going to shoot the son of a bitch, he said. Screw diplomacy, we'll do it my way. I talked him out of it. He's a smart man. We went back to the chairman and we talked him out of it again. The referendum was postponed. Diplomacy is hard, it's often frustrating. But the point of the story is not diplomacy, I'll do that in a later talk, but how determined people are to be independent. How language and culture determines your fate how migration, in the case of the Kurds, forced migra migration in the 1980s, shapes nations, and how wealth and power go hand in hand. I'll talk a bit more about the Kurds later on uh, tonight, but as we sail away from Monaco, well, we're not quite sailed away, but as we're here in Monaco, let's take a look around us first, where those same issues influence current politics in Spain, France, and Italy. Three main themes. Language is vitally important to the cohesion of a nation and is often a factor in that nation's dissolution. Migration is forever. Humans have always been on the move to escape a bad situation, war, disease, floods, famine, overcrowding, or simply to head for greener pastures. Wealth matters. It means power, and power corrupts. Wealth inequality inevitably leads to revolution. Revolutions almost always end badly. It's interesting to talk about wealth inequality here in Monaco. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. More than 36 years in the State Department. I've served in South Asia first and then 25 years in the Middle East. I was a guy in the trenches working on the ever-elusive Israeli-Palestinian agreement, the strain of U.S.-Iran relations, the misguided hubris of our, of our Iraq policies, the tragedy of Yemen, the demand for Kurdish justice, and the Shia-Sunni divide in the Gulf. It's easy stuff. It's not a lot of progress, not many celebrations, and way too much violence. 
too many wars. It was not a smooth ride, but I learned about the basic resilience of people and their basic goodness that made more terrible the failures of their corrupt and unresponsive leaders. I learned about the huge and sometimes awful impact of religion. And I learned about the universal, desperate, and too often unrequited desire for justice, for independence, and for simple, good government. And as we move through my short series of lectures, I've tried to focus on themes from that time in the Middle East. One more time, migration, language, and wealth. Migration, the near constant movement of people around the world. Language, which is really the strongest tie to your tribe. And wealth, the power of money, those who have it and those who don't. Okay, looking at Europe. 1,500 years later. I love maps. I love to travel. It's easy to say in this audience. We all love to travel. Maps show us the impermanence of boundaries, of borders. Empires rise. Empires fall, nations form, and nations divide. No country lasts forever. The nations that crowd the southern coastline of Europe, around which we're sailing these two weeks, have not always been there. Some are newer than others. Some are rooted in antiquity. Some are recently cobbled together. Some have fallen apart. And as a diplomat, I learned early on that history matters. Before you get to current events, Take a look at what's happened. Despite our desire to keep things together, the almost religious adherence in the United States and Washington to the foreign policy canon of stability, national sovereignty, and territorial integrity, nations sometimes fall apart. It's important to learn a bit of history, try to understand what matters to the parties who are sitting around that negotiating table. The fault lines ingrained in each nation and language, ethnicity, wealth, alliances, past victories, past defeats. They do not disappear when new nations are formed. Whether those nations gather member states willingly or by force, those fault lines can reemerge to split nations again. I watched this happen in Iraq and Yemen. It can happen anywhere. So, language, migration, and wealth. As we look at the contemporary politics in Spain, France, and Italy, I'll draw on a bit of history first to help me understand those issues today. First to Spain, specifically where we were in Barcelona, Catalonia. I read a lot of international news. It's what I did for a living. I'm, I'm addicted. And I was fascinated to learn that the Catalan independence movement is gaining more traction these days. In, in 2017, Catalonian leaders held an illegal referendum on this issue. The central government in Madrid dissolved Catalonia's government and arrested about a dozen of the main leaders whose trial is ongoing and has yet to be decided. Language, specifically Catalan, is one of the issues. So is migration, so is money. Barcelona is a wealthy city. Okay, before we go, I'm going to go back just a few years, and I want to think about a couple of isms as we look at Spanish history and Spanish politics. We all know these. Fascism, communism, socialism, and nationalism. And we have a few notions about these political ideas, I suspect mostly negative, uh, and with good reason, at least for the first two. Fascism. No one likes to be called a fascist. No politician claims that title today. It's perhaps best exemplified by Italy's Mussolini in the 1930s and by Generalissimo, Frank, uh, Generalissimo Francisco Franco of Spain, who preferred to be called a nationalist or a conservative monarchist, but whom history has deemed a fascist. Communism. Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, 1930s Stalin. The Soviet Union, at least in theory, was a communist country. I'm not sure about Trotsky and Lenin, but Stalin was no communist. I grew up fearing and hating communists. Khrushchev, we will bury you, the bomb, the reds. The next two isms are a bit harder to pin down. Socialism. Socialism crops up everywhere in our lives. 
Indeed, the Spanish socialists just won the national election. We have Social Security, Medicare. In Great Britain, the National Health Service. There are public utilities, public education, socialist organizations. There are social democrats and Christian socialists. We tend to think that socialists are a bit fuzzy-minded, idealists mostly. I don't know. Is Bernie Sanders really a socialist? He doesn't strike me as a fuzzy-minded idealist. I don't know. Isms can be tricky. And finally, one that's cropped up more in the news these days, nationalism. For better or worse, and mostly for worse, of course, the Nazis gave nationalism a bad name. But today there are proud Scottish nationalists. Nationalist parties are on the rise in Spain, in France, and in Italy, and elsewhere. In the States, we tend to use the word patriotism, a noble term for the love of one's country, rather than nationalism because of its tainted past. But even in the States, there's more talk of a nationalist policy. So with these isms in mind, we'll take a very quick look at the Spanish Civil War, where fascists, nationalists, and monarchists, led by Francisco Franco, supported by Hitler and Mussolini, fought the Republicans, a loosely allied group of various communist and socialist parties, who sometimes turned their weapons on each other. They were supported by Stalin, and what was called the international conscience of the world, whatever that meant. But there were a lot of international volunteers, including Brits, Americans, Canadians, and Australians, who were not necessarily communists or socialists, but who saw the Spanish Civil War as the first battleground against Hitler and the fascists. The main Republican stronghold was Barcelona, that fact still resonates today, especially when we talk about Franco's repressive regime and the ongoing debate about a strong central government versus greater regional autonomy. Uh, Ernest Hemingway reported on the war from the Republican side, for whom the bell tolls, is still a gripping read and an evocative description of the mixed loyalties and internal conflict of the Spanish Civil War in perhaps of all wars. And George Orwell, best known for Animal Farm in 1984, actually fought in the war and was wounded. He barely escaped capture and, and likely execution by a rival Republican militia. He wrote a series of essays on the war, and there's a square in Barcelona named after him, which we never found. Uh, it's a, there was a terrible bloodletting, atrocities on all sides. The Republicans were defeated, and Franco established an authoritarian dictatorship supported by German Nazis and Italian fascists. Uh, Guernica was the site of one of the war's worst atrocities. Franco called in German and Italian bombers to carpet bomb civilian neighborhoods in the Basque town in Biscay. Picasso's painting here is perhaps the most famous depiction of this massacre. If you want to learn a bit more about the war, uh, with some stunning film footage, there's an excellent piece on the Civil War on Viking Entertainment Spain program uh, uh, on your television. It's film clips of the war in Franco. I highly recommend it. From 1939 uh, and the end of the Civil War, Franco takes Spain from an authoritarian dictatorship to a constitutional monarchy in 1975 a remarkable and difficult journey for Spain and Spaniards, and it's still very much a part of Spanish living memory. Franco's government was deeply repressive. He tolerated no political opposition. His policies included forcing the Spanish language in schools and media in Catalonia and in the Basque region and elsewhere. He was a rabid anti-communist who tried to keep Spain out of World War II although he allowed Germany and Italy generous use of Spanish ports and facilities. His economy was a state-run mess, based on the spurious economic theory of autarky, in which a nation tries to produce everything it needs for its own internal economy and restricts all imports. 
economic self-sufficiency. This works almost as well as communism does. I'm going to go back for a second. There we are. Um, losing track, sorry. Spain was one of the poorest countries in Europe in the 1960s, until the 1960s when Franco was forced to change course and he liberalized and privatized much of the economy. Political life, however, remained severely repressed. And before his death in 1975, Franco asked Juan Carlos I, the grandson of the last Spanish monarch, to reclaim the Spanish throne and rule as king after Franco's death. But Juan Carlos surprised Franco and his supporters by quickly allowing a stronger parliament, constitutional amendments, reducing his own power, and creating a true constitutional monarchy. A coup attempt by Franco loyalists in 1981 was defeated. A quick aside, when I was the US ambassador to the Kingdom of Bahrain a few years ago, King Hamad bin El Khalifa often cited Juan Carlos as his example. Hamad claimed to be creating a constitutional monarchy in Bahrain, but in my opinion, he has a long way to go. Juan Carlos voluntarily gave up substantial power. Very unusual. Hamad has thrown his opposition in jail, postponed elections, and consolidated his power. He's no Juan Carlos. Now to Catalonia, the semi-autonomous province of modern-day Spain. We spent a couple days in Barcelona, the capital, largest city of Catalonia, and, as I s and the second largest city in Spain. We may have read mem you may have read menus in Spanish and Catalan. We heard the distinctive sound of Catalan on the streets. And I took photos of balconies draped in Catalonian flags with signs that read, and I know there's a Catalan speaker in the crew, so Libertat Presos Politics, which means free the political prisoners, referring to those Catalan government leaders who are currently in jail uh, undergoing trial. Many Catalans today are pushing toward greater independence from Spain. In two recent referenda, Catalans voted to establish a separate state. The votes were not binding. As I said, they were declared illegal by the government. And only 40% of eligible voters actually participated. There is a sizable Spanish population in Barcelona and Catalonia as well. But the rumblings for greater independence have not diminished, that the Spanish government charge the political leaders with defying their constitutional order. And they also charge them with sedition, undermining the central state, serious charges. The trial's ongoing. It could result in their imprisonment, which would undoubtedly only increase their stature as Catalonian patriots and encourage greater opposition to the central government. As I said in the beginning, nations come together Spain is an old nation, but they also can fall apart. There's a very natural desire to be independent, to strike off on one's own with one's own tribe, to blame your troubles, whatever they might be, on a central government, distant central government. Maybe it's the federals. Blame it on the federales. Blame it on Madrid. Blame it on Washington. Now, I think there's a long way to go before the central government would move to counter the, Itali uh, the Catalonian independence movement more forcefully, action that would lead to civil war and increased violence. Similar to that which plagued the Basque region, if you recall the Basque uh, uh, separatists of the 1980s, uh, until the government granted Basque substantial autonomy. If the government was as generous with Catalonia as they were with, ba with the Basque region, which is a significantly poorer region, uh, it would be a huge blow to the national economy, uh, taking perhaps as much as 20% of the GDP of Spain with it. It would be like California breaking from the US or, maybe more pertinent, Scotland from the UK. The newly formed central government the socialist, led by Pedro Sanchez, is committed to negotiation with Catalan separatists, but it has drawn a very hard line against actual 
separation. And opposition parties, including the newly formed Vox, the hardline nationalist party led by Santiago Abascal, are gaining ground in national politics. They are firmly opposed to greater Catalan autonomy and certainly to independence. It was a rallying point for the nationalists in this last election. The power of language. As I said, Catalans have long strove to protect their language, which is related to Spanish, French, and Italian, but quite distinct from them. There have been several attempts by Spanish central authorities going back to the days of the empire, and most harshly under Franco, to suppress Catalan by outlawing its use in official documents and in government schools. Franco suspected Catalans as communist sympathizers. They mostly supported the Republican side in the Civil War. Tens of thousands of Catalans were arrested and jailed during his regime. Now, during my diplomatic career, language has been the source of revolts, wars, and violence. In South India, where there were massive violent anti-Hindi language riots in 1965 when the central government in Delhi proposed to switch the national language from English to Hindi. This was still very much an issue in 1982 when I served in Madras, now called Chennai. I conducted visa interviews in Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, or Malayali, using interpreters, of course. India now has 23 official languages, including English. In Iraqi Kurdistan, Saddam's draconian Arabization policies in the 1980s attempted to eradicate the Kurdish language in schools and official matters. Kur Kurds were forced from their homes and required to accept Arab names and learn the language if they wanted to own property get a job, or go to school. Thousands fled their villages for the mountains in the north. These measures led to the near genocide of Iraqi Kurds who refused to become Arab. You might recall the brutal chemical attacks on Kurdish towns like Halabja in 1988. Today, Iraqi Kurdistan is a wholly autonomous region of Iraq where many younger Kurds speak only Kurdish and refuse to learn Arabic a factor driving the region even farther from Baghdad than ever. And last year, Kurds voted overwhelmingly to become independent, causing Turkey, Iran, and Baghdad to threaten military action against an independent Kurdistan. And the US, the UK, and the EU, and others all criticized Kurdish leadership for taking such a dangerous step, basically cutting them off from any assistance if they pursued independence. There is a current stalemate, but no one who's ever worked with the Kurds doubts the intensity of their desire for independence, despite the odds and the undoubted negative impact of such a move. The desire to be independent is very powerful. And finally, we all recall the Quebec independence movement in the 1960s and 70s. It still resonates today. French is the official language of Quebec and is spoken nearly everywhere in the province with English as a second language. Although in my experience, and our son married, uh, studied in Quebec, in Montreal, and married a wonderful Quebecois woman, and he currently lives in Montreal, most young urban Quebecois speak both English and French equally flu fluently, and it's not such a big issue anymore. Central governments in distant capitals try to do it. Revolutions, violent resistance, and acts of terrorism are often the sad result. Let's move quickly to France. France is one of the oldest nations in Europe. We heard a great lecture the other night on the history of France from, from our historian, Dr. Jill. Um, um, I'm sorry. Uh, France, uh, uh, you know, France is one of the oldest nations in Europe, despite numerous shifts in its boundaries. Many brutal and lengthy wars with Spain, England, Prussia, Germany, Russia. There hasn't always been a France, but I won't go back that far. Dr. Livingston's talk on French history is on Viking TV, and I recommend it to those who want a deeper dive into French history. 
The French are justly proud of their sense of being French. To be a citizen of France is to be French. For centuries, their language, literature, and culture have bound them closely together, even during periods of great internal strife, including the revolution of 1789 when they beheaded the king and overthrew the government. Language has been and remains a very strong adhesive in France. France has an institute to protect the purity of French called the Académie Française. It has tried to keep words like computer, cheeseburger, email, and blue jeans out of the French language completely unsuccessfully. All language has a way of seeping through the cracks of proper usage. But let's move from language to the next theme, which is migration, and one that I think is more salient to French politics today. France has always accepted new citizens, immigrants, many in fact during the past few decades. In my last position in the Foreign Service as an advisor on counterterrorism, my portfolio included building an international alliance to stop the recruitment of what we call foreign fighters to go and fight with the Islamic State, ISIS, in Iraq and Syria. I traveled to France a few times. The French government was grappling with a response to counter this new development, and we were working with them to establish a set of international laws to improve border policing, identity verification, travel monitoring, and prosecution of terrorists and their recruiters. I recall asking a senior official in the Ministry of Interior, the French Security Ministry, if he knew how many Arab Muslims, this is the primary population from which the foreign fighters were being recruited, how many Arab Muslims lived in France? There's been an Arab origin population for centuries, of course, but in the last 70 years or so, immigration from France's former colonies in North Africa increased that number greatly. Most of these immigrants were granted French citizenship soon after arrival, often due to their prior status in colonial Algeria or Tunisia or Morocco, and they often spoke fluent French too, having been educated in French schools. They became French citizens. And said this official, that was that. They are French, like me, no difference. And their children are French. The government did not keep count, even casually, of the ethnicity, origin, or religion of these new arrivals. It was even forbidden by law until just a few years ago. Once someone got their citizenship, they're French. Now this is a sensitive subject in many countries, including the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia. We're all struggling to deal with immigration in a, in a sensible, fair, moral, and just manner. It's perhaps easier for us, Canadians, Americans, Australians, we're countries of immigrants. It's a core strength, I believe, of the United States. There have been difficult periods in our history, even now, but we've always come back to that core American principle. We're a country of immigrants. But France does not think of itself as a country of immigrants. Everyone is French. There are, no dif there are differences, of course. It's not ethnically homogenous. Dialects of the language exist. Old languages are still spoken here and there in bits and pieces. But in, and in general, France welcomed new immigrants from Vietnam, West Africa, and the Arab world. Granted them full citizenship, declared them French, and then ignored them. But opportunities are not equal, and the disenfranchisement and disadvantages of some of these new French citizens, mostly the new immigrants from North Africa, most of whom are Muslims, have yet to be fully addressed. Tensions are inevitable, and those tensions are sometimes exploited by politicians. And when I think of French politics, I think of de Gaulle, Mitterrand, and Macron, the current president. De Gaulle needs no introduction. He dominated post-World War II French politics and policies. He opposed American involvement in Vietnam, somewhat hypocritically considering France's tarnished history there. He did not fully accept NATO. He vetoed British membership in the European economic community, the front runner to the European Union. 
and he supported Quebec separatists in Canada. Vive le Quebec, he shouted during a speech in 1967. De Gaulle was an unabashed French patriot, a nationalist, who steadfastly insisted on France's role as a world power, even when that power was more smoke than fire. Francois Mitterrand was the great French socialist, who was the longest serving French president in history, 1981 to 1995. He gave French workers the 35 hour work week and mandatory vacations. Avoid France in August. Everyone's on vacation. Mitterrand abolished state control over TV and radio, and he partnered with Germany's Helmut Kohl to increase European integration. In many ways, he was the opposite of Charles de Gaulle. And today, we have Emmanuel Macron, France's youngest president, just 39 years old when he was elected in 2017. He, he was a member of Hollande's socialist government. He was the Minister of Economy and Finance, but he resigned from the Socialist Party in 2015. He's independent, he's a former investment banker, and he formed a new party called En Marche. Their focus is on the economy. On incre they increased the work week from 35 to shock, 37 hours, and they're pro-business and they're pro-EU. And on Macron's right, appropriately, is Marine Le Pen, the current leader of the National Front, a rightist party founded by her father, who was an unabashed anti-immigrant, French nationalist, and hardliner. His daughter renamed the party the National Rally, and, and she lost a runoff election to Macron in 2017 by a sizable margin. Now, she's tried to soften the image of the party from her father's day, but she remains anti-immigration and anti-globalization. She wants a weaker European Union, and, and she claims that she would leave, she would take France out of NATO, she would be a closer partner with Russia, and she would distance France from U.S. influence. Last point on France, protests. French strikes are a national sport, eclipsed only by soccer in popularity. Airport workers, train conductors, truckers, farmers, teachers, every French worker seems to love a strike. To the barricades still resounds on the streets of Paris and Lyon. For years I avoided flying into Paris, certain that the baggage handlers or the bus drivers or the taxis or, God forbid, the bartenders and waiters would be on strike. The yellow vests pictured here, and they're named for the safety reflective vests that are required to be carried in all vehicles for emergencies. There's something different. The strikes and demonstrations began last year, initially a reaction to a sharp rise in the cost of fuel and other costs of living, and the government also lowered the speed limit on some roads which infuriated rural citizens who ha often had long commutes to the city and their jobs. Dozens of new speed cameras that they placed on the highway have been vandalized. The movement, if it can be called that, spans the political spectrum, including some former supporters of Macron. Uh, there's no defined leadership. It's kind of like the Tea Party in the US or Occupy Wall Street, but it's much, much larger in scope. There were massive demonstrations in Paris last year near the Arc de Triomphe. There's been some violence. It's at an ebb right now, but it poses a real challenge to Macron's leadership. His approval numbers have dipped below 25%. He's had to rescind a number of policies to appease the workers and the strikers, a lesson all of his predecessors have had to learn. Never underestimate a French strike. Now, France, too, will hold together for certain, but the fault lines in its population the issue of immigration will continue to grab headlines and decide elections. The question of Frenchness, are some citizens more French than others, still remains to be answered. Finally, Italy, and we're on our way to Italy tomorrow, one of my favorite countries in the world. And it was a nation that originally was made up of dozens of city-states and united only 150 years ago 
after centuries of wars between the city-states and foreign invasions. And when I think of Italian city-states, I think of Shakespeare. Romeo and Juliet, Fair Verona, the Capulets, the Montagues, Othello, the Moor in Venice. Shakespeare liked to set his plays in Italian city-states. The Taming of the Shrew is in Padua, The Merchant of Venice, Much Ado About Nothing in Messina, Sicily. These Italian cities were seen by English theatergoers as exotic, dynamic, very sexy, politically charged, and wealthy. He couldn't set these stories in the England of 1600. It was just too risky. Elizabeth I loved the theater, but she was prone to decapitate anyone who would upset her. I have to give a shout out to Machiavelli. Dr. Livingston also mentioned him in her, uh, her lecture. Uh, but he still resonates in politics in Italy today and around the world, and anyone who studied political science starts often with Machiavelli. He was a Florentine, an Italian diplomat, a politician, a historian, a philosopher, a humanist, a writer, a playwright, and a poet. And he's been called the father of modern political science. For many years, he was a senior official in the Florentine Republic with responsibilities in diplomatic and military affairs. He's best known for his political how-to manual, The Prince, which was written in 1513. And the term Machiavellian has come to stand in for the book's central theme, namely, the end justifies the means. He observed that princes can and do use unsavory, brutish, deceptive tactics to gain and maintain power. You've heard a lot about Florence uh, already. You're going tomorrow. It was one of the wealthiest and most powerful of the city-states. It competed with Rome for religious authority. The Medici, again, Dr. Livingston's lecture on the Medici gives a lot of details uh, on this very powerful family, patrons of the arts. And following their downfall, Florence was subjected to the rule of Austria and France as the great European powers, the great empires of France, the Habsburgs, the Russians, began to compete throughout Europe for power, including on the Italian peninsula. Uh, other influential city-states, I'm going to see if I can start this one. Other influential city-states that we'll be visiting in a few days was the Kingdom of Naples, soon to be called the Kingdom of Naples. That's working, all right. Uh, <laughs> My wife is responsible for all of the pictures. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, Napoleon was the king of Naples in Italy from 1805 to 1814. He defeated the Austrians. Uh, it was broke up in 1814 after Waterloo when Napoleon was defeated and, and the Austrians moved back in and, of the, uh, uh, and, then, and reclaimed Naples. Italy united in 1871, finally, not quite there yet, after a long and sometimes violent slog, the Young Italy movement was led by a man named Giuseppe Garibaldi, and he was the principal force. He led successful military campaigns to unite southern Italy and then the entire country as we know it today. Italy suffered greatly in the 20th century wars, especially in World War II. Benito Mussolini, the prime minister from 1822 to 43, he created a one-party state and declared himself dictator. The Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935 was condemned by most of the world but supported by Hitler, who modeled some of his Nazi policies after the Italian fascists. Mussolini lent massive support to Franco's forces in Spain during the Civil War. He resisted war with Great Britain and France, but Hitler, who had been his protege, had grown too powerful, and Italy, with considerable re reluctance, entered the war in 1940, and its military was woefully prepared for war with the Allies. And following the invasions of Sicily and southern Italy, it surrendered in 1943. Mussolini was deposed and murdered, the new government threw its support to the American and British, which led to an increased 
German occupation of the entire country. Italy suffered terrible destruction during particularly vicious fighting, especially in the South. It emerged from the war broken and destitute. Its recovery is one of the many triumphs of post-war Europe. Today, I love these guys, today there is a multi-multi-party system in Italy. Italy has endured a rotating series of coalition governments that don't last very long. They collapse like houses of cards over some political, economic, cultural issue, over migration, over wealth distribution. The current government, represented by these fine men, uh, is a right-wing coalition led from the center, by, led from the wings by Matteo Salvini, down in the corner there, a hardline anti-immigration and anti-globalization politician. And and by former a former prime minister, the infamous uh, uh, Silvio Berlusconi. You might remember him. He's the bunga bunga party guy. The third member of the government is the independent Five Star Movement, which is led by an, a popular Italian comedian, uh, uh, Beppe Grillo. These leaders have formed a loose coalition, agreeing last year to the current prime minister, a political non-entity, and a technocrat named Giuseppe Conte. And with those three in charge, we should pray that Mr. Conte remains sane. There's a weakened, left-leaning coalition led by the Democratic Party in opposition, and there's a few other parties too, too many to list or ever remember. There have been 43 Italian prime ministers since abolishment of the monarchy in 1946. Berlusconi was the longest serving. And there's another government coming soon, maybe before we arrive in Naples tomorrow, I'm sure. Now please don't ask me to provide further details on Italian politics at least before we share a nice bottle of Chianti. Last thing on Italy. The great divide in Italy, with all the sometimes craziness of Italian politics aside, the great divide is north-south. The north is wealthier, healthier, better educated. The south is poorer and has perhaps the unfair reputation of being more corrupt and crime-ridden. In fact, the Italian mafia is spread across the entire country, and not just, as the Godfather myths have taught us, a Sicilian monopoly. But you can see in this chart the disparity in GDP from the north, where it's 35,000 euros, to the south, where it's as low as 20,000 euros. Some of the right-wing northern parties, notably Salvini's Northern League, have talked about a split cutting off the south. Although that, that, those talks have been basically focused on illegal immigration. You may remember the boat people coming in from Turkey and up from Libya into southern, uh, southern Italy. Most of those immigrants stay in the south, uh, where they work illegally in agriculture. Silvini's party, the Northern League, has been making electoral inroads in the south, however, so they've lightened their criticism recently of the, refugee, uh, of the foreign workers. And the flow of refugees from Syria and Libya, West Africa, has lessened somewhat. There's not much national traction for a split in the country. But that rich-poor fault line remains, and like all fault lines, it is exploited by unscrupulous and power-hungry politicians. So language, migration, and wealth. Great countries can be created from a common language. They can be created from a policy of attracting and absorbing migrants and a fair distribution of wealth. Those same factors, a dominant oppressive language policy, fear of migrants, and a concentration of wealth in an elite can bring a country down. I've seen it happen. But we're here for the food. And you're all waiting for dinner, as am I. And what incredible cooks we have on board this Viking ship. Four days in, I've gained five pounds. From paella to pasta, 
There's great wine, the historical sites, the lovely weather, the art, the chance to meet new people and see new places. What I like most about Viking are all the people that I get to meet, and I hope I have a chance to engage with many of you throughout the next 10 days of the cruise. And what I wanted to do tonight is not put you to sleep, but just give you a taste of some of the underlying political issues that exist in Spain, France, and Italy. A little bit of a bouillabaisse, kind of a hurried stew. They'll, I won't give a quiz, I promise, but I do hope that these insights have enriched your experience. Now, I don't have any time for questions or comments, I'm afraid, and I really do like to engage. So I'll hang around just outside the theater for a few minutes, and if there's interest, maybe later on we can set up a time up in the Explorer's Lounge or elsewhere where we can talk about some of these issues or about some of the things I will discuss in the, the next two talks, uh, one on democracy going back to ancient Athens and the roots of democracy and bringing it up today to the state of democracy today with a focus on uh, our ongoing efforts to build a democracy in Iraq, an uh, enterprise I was too intimately involved in. Uh, and then a third lecture later on in Dubrovnik on Yugoslavia, showing a country coming together from two broken empires, the Ottomans and the Habsburgs, uh, being held together by someone I think is one of the most remarkable individuals in 20th century politics, Josef Broz Tito, and then falling apart dramatically and violently in the 1990s uh, to separate again into the countries uh, uh, today, one of which Croatia will be visiting on our trip. So, enjoy your dinner if you haven't already. Thanks for coming, uh, and thanks for listening.